Tonight at 10, we're live in Downing Street where Boris Johnson is defying a chorus of calls from colleagues for him to resign. As he left for the Commons earlier today, the Prime Minister was aware that dozens of ministers and aides were heading for the exit. So far, there have been at least 43 resignations. It's a record number for one day. But the Prime Minister responded with defiance to critics on his own side. At Westminster tonight, the Prime Minister is still determined to hang on. And he's still hiring and firing. Does the Prime Minister think there are any circumstances in which he should resign? <laughs> Frankly, Mr Speaker, the job of a Prime Minister in difficult circumstances when he's been handed a colossal mandate is to keep going, and that's what I'm going to do. Anyone quitting now after defending all that hasn't got a shred of integrity. Yeah. Mr Speaker, isn't this the first recorded case of the sinking ships fleeing the rat? Well, a short while ago, we were told that the Prime Minister has sacked Michael Gove, one of the government's most senior figures. We'll have more on that. Also tonight, British Airways cuts a further 10,000 short-haul flights from now to the end of October. And in football, England get off to a winning start in the opening match of the Women's Euros at Old Trafford. And stay with us on BBC News for continuing coverage and analysis from our team of correspondents in the UK and around the world. Very good evening from Downing Street, where Boris Johnson is tonight being urged to resign by some of his most senior colleagues who believe he has clearly lost the confidence of most of his MPs. Mr Johnson has been inside number 10 here meeting cabinet colleagues, some of whom still believe he should stay on, but most seem to be convinced that his time is up. A short while ago, Michael Gove, one of the government's most prominent members, was sacked by Mr Johnson. Nadim Zahawi, who was appointed as Chancellor just last night, is believed to be among those who want Mr Johnson to step aside, as are Grant Chaps and Priti Patel, key allies of the Prime Minister until today. At least 43 ministers and aides have left the government since yesterday, when Sajid Javid and Rishi Sunak resigned from the Cabinet. Mr Johnson told MPs earlier today he would not resign, and the message from Number 10 tonight is that he fully intends to fulfil the mandate that he won at the last election. So with the breaking news about the sacking of Michael Gove, let's uh, bring in Chris Mason, our political editor. What's happened, Chris? Well, the Prime Minister has latched upon a novel technique, Hugh, for dealing with the prospects of Cabinet Ministers resigning. What is that technique? It is to sack them. And that is what's happened, as you say, in the last hour, Boris Johnson phoning Michael Gove, sacking him as Community Secretary. There is, you might remember, real history between these two men. Rewind a few years when the Prime Minister was initially, Boris Johnson was initially hoping to become Prime Minister. It was Michael Gove who scuppered his attempts that time round. Theresa May went on to become Prime Minister. Tonight he has been sacked and an extraordinary briefing from inside that building tonight explaining the sacking describing Michael Gove, and I quote, as a snake. Someone that, in the view of the Prime Minister, could not be trusted to be a positive articulator of the government's message. The latest extraordinary twist in another incredible day here at Westminster. Let me bring you a flavour of that day in the next few minutes. The front pages, the photographers, the reporters, all asking the same thing. The lenses tilt towards Boris Johnson leaving Downing Street, heading for Parliament at lunchtime, and Prime Minister's questions. The difficult questions usually come from the opposition benches. Today, they came from Conservative MPs as well. The Prime Minister constantly tries to deflect from the issue, always tries to blame other people for mistakes. 
and that at least nothing um, left for him to do other than to take responsibility and resign. Today I ask him to do the honourable thing, to put the interests of the nation before his own interests and before, in, in, in his own words, it does become impossible for government to do its job. Does the Prime Minister think there are any circumstances in which he should resign? <laughs> Frankly, Mr Speaker, the job of a Prime Minister in difficult circumstances when he's been handed a colossal mandate is to keep going, and that's what I'm going to do. And when it was the Labour leader's turn, he took aim at those in the Cabinet. Only in office, because no-one else is prepared to debase themselves any longer, the charge of the lightweight brigade. <laughs> Have some self-respect. In the middle of a crisis, doesn't the country deserve better yes. than a Z-list cast of nodding dogs? Yes. Mr Speaker, the, the difference between this government and that opposition is we have a plan and they do not. We're, and we're getting on. They want to focus on this type of issue, Mr Speaker. We're going to get on with our jobs. Ian Blackford. The Scottish National Party leader at Westminster is often remorselessly barracked by Conservative MPs. Not today. Let's face it, it's a minor miracle that the Prime Minister has even made it through to Prime Minister's questions, and he really ought to see the faces behind him, because, Prime Minister, it really is over. The Prime Minister is desperately clinging on to his own fantasy, but the public can't afford to put up with this farce of a government a minute longer. All day, it felt at times like every ten minutes or so, Conservative MPs were sending letters saying the Prime Minister should go. And just take a look at the language chosen by the now former Justice Minister Victoria Atkins as she resigned. Values such as integrity, decency, respect and professionalism should matter to us all. I have watched with growing concern as those values have fractured under your leadership. I can no longer pirouette around our fractured values. Are we witnessing the collapse of the government, Mr Javid? And from a letter to a resignation statement from the man who just yesterday was Boris Johnson's health secretary. I call Sajid Javid. Have a look at the body language of the Conservative benches as you listen to Mr Javid's words. Treading the tightrope between loyalty and integrity has become impossible in recent months. And Mr Speaker, I will never risk losing my integrity. And now this week again, we have reason to question the truth and integrity of what we've all been told. And at some point, we have to conclude that enough is enough. Yeah. I believe that point is now. He said he had been patient, hoping things would improve. But I do fear that the reset button can only work so many times. There's only so many times you can turn that machine on and off before you realise that something is fundamentally wrong. And then there was this, a public laser-guided attack on those still in Boris Johnson's cabinet. They will have their own reasons, but it is, it is a choice. I know just how difficult that choice is, but let's be clear, not Doing something is an active decision. I am deeply concerned about how the next generation will see the Conservative Party on our current course. Can I say to the House, there will be no more personal statements today. But he was back again down the corridor a few hours later, facing the liaison committee of senior backbenchers. Prime Minister. How's, how's your week going? Terrific. Turns out they had been keeping up with the news. It's, it's being reported that there's a delegation of your cabinet colleagues waiting in Downing Street, including the chief whip, the transport secretary and your new chancellor, waiting to tell you when you finish here today that it's time for you to go. How will you respond to that? You're asking me to comment uh, on... This conversation uh, will it's... happen in a few minutes, Prime Minister. You say, you say. Uh, but I, I, I'm not going to give a, a running commentary on political events, uh, we're going to get on with the government of the country. This morning, the Community Secretary Michael Gove went to see the Prime Minister to tell him he thought he should resign. 
in the last hour, the man who just yesterday sat around Boris Johnson's cabinet table was sacked by him, with a number 10 source describing Mr Gove as a snake. This was the scene in Downing Street this evening. Drivers hanging around while cabinet ministers went inside. Some saying Mr Johnson should go, others saying he should stay. The culture secretary is still supportive. <laughs> Westminster is a postcode defined by power. Today has been defined by it draining away from Boris Johnson. But he's not shifting at least yet. Well, back here in Downing Street tonight with uh, a pretty big crowd of protesters who've gathered uh, just outside the gates on Whitehall. Chris is still with me. Um, Chris, this note of defiance that's come through loud and clear tonight from Downing Street, but at one stage today, people were talking fairly confidently about the Prime Minister actually going. When I was talking to George on the 6 o'clock news, I was anticipating that there was a possibility, nothing more than that, but a possibility that within a couple of hours there might have been a lectern just behind us here with the Prime Minister preparing to come out and, and offer his resignation. And that was an, a view articulated by plenty of Conservative MPs. It hasn't happened because there is that defiance, that determination from the Prime Minister to stick around. And the argument he's making is one that he was making last night as well and we talked about. He's saying, look, there might be 40-odd colleagues who were saying I should resign, but there were nearly 14 million people who voted for the Conservatives led by Boris Johnson at the last general election. That, for him, is his mandate. And what he's saying to his MPs is you can either keep me with a new Chancellor and our plan for the economy, they're due to give a speech next week, or you can have a period of chaos around a leadership race and then the prospect, so he says, of a general election that might be sooner rather than later. And he is saying to Conservative MPs, look at the opinion polls, that might mean that the Conservatives are out of power. Crucially though, Hugh, those who want to see Boris Johnson go, they are motivated, yes, by the distaste for many around his character and his attitude, but fundamentally it's because they think they would lose with him as leader. So that's the trade-off that's going on. Boris Johnson saying, if I go, you lose, and them saying to him, if you stay, we lose. Chris, in a while we'll talk in more detail about the exact options uh, for the party and for the Prime Minister, but uh, for now, thanks very much. Chris Mason there, our political editor. Well, Boris Johnson has now broken a British political record for the highest number of ministerial resignations in the space of just 24 hours. One in five of those Conservative MPs who held ministerial or other official posts have now resigned. And here's the list that's going on the screen now, all of them gone since Sajid Javid resigned as Health Secretary yesterday. And they do, of course, include Rishi Sunak, who resigned as Chancellor of the Exchequer, along with dozens of ministers and ministerial aides. So far, 43 have resigned uh, and we're still counting. Our Deputy Political Editor, Vicky Young, examines the possible next steps. Time to speak out. Dozens of Conservative ministers and MPs have had enough. Some have been critical for months. Others stayed loyal to Boris Johnson, but not anymore. I've never done this before. It is not in my nature to uh, go on about Prime Minister. I challenge the government policy rather than personalities, but I just think we've reached an end point. We are just constantly going from one crisis to another under this leadership and, and, a, a, and a reluctance to accept where those problems came from and we've got to concentrate on these issues that are really affecting people. This, this charade has to stop. I feel for the Prime Minister, I really do. Uh, I like the man, I've got a huge amount of respect for the man, but I cannot let this pass. As support drained away, the Prime Minister's closest allies tried their best to fight his corner. Just My to message to colleagues is calm down. Calm down. Really? They're, be, they're, are they overreacting? Be very in, careful. In your view, be even very though... careful where we go here. Why? Be very careful about bringing down a Prime Minister who won a very personal mandate from the British people in 2019. Liam Fox has stayed loyal to every Conservative leader since he was first elected in 1992, but he told me Mr Johnson has squandered too many second chances. The way things have been handled, the way that lines constantly change, the way that ministers therefore can't with any confidence repeat the line that they're being given, uh, I think all of this incrementally uh, damages credibility so much that it's difficult to lead. And I hope that for his own sake, but for the sake of the Conservative Party, the government, and most importantly the country, 
uh, he goes quickly. Prime Ministers rarely get to choose how they leave office. Margaret Thatcher promised to fight on, but her cabinet told her it was time to go. John Major survived rebellions, staggered to an election and was beaten in a landslide. David Cameron recognised that losing the EU referendum was a resigning matter. Do, 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 do. Theresa May won a vote of confidence but left a few months later. It's obviously incredibly tough on them personally. Uh, these things normally build up over a long period of time. But I think most people who've done the job get to a point where they recognise that time's up and that it's not actually in, the, in their own interest in terms of their legacy or their party's interest or the country's interest for them to carry on. I can announce that the parliamentary party does have confidence. Yeah. Yeah. This group of MPs could have a crucial role to play if Boris Johnson refuses to leave. The 1922 committee could organise another vote of confidence. Boris Johnson won the Conservatives their biggest election victory in more than 30 years. Many MPs backed him because they wanted to make sure Brexit happened. But he hasn't been able to translate that success on the campaign trail into government. And many in his own party have now turned against him, fearing he was tarnishing their reputation as well as his own. He can drag out his departure, but few think Boris Johnson has got long left in number 10. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Vicky there with uh, the view of some of Boris Johnson's own MPs. But what about the millions of voters who gave uh, Mr Johnson a resounding election victory less than three years ago in December 19? Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth has been gauging the mood in Wiltshire. Summer in Salisbury and things might seem serene. This city's in the heart of Wiltshire, fairly solid Tory turf. The party holds all seven parliamentary seats. But at this local bistro, four Conservatives from across the county have been watching closely as the tension unfurls in Westminster. Personally, I, I'm very disappointed in so are the members as well. Um, last night I was talking to quite a few residents and they were still, you know, they're probably supporters. They, OK, they didn't mind. A lot of, like a lot of people didn't mind he'd had a beer or done something like that. But this, being lied to, this is a totally different game. Here, they say Downing Street's response to allegations about the deputy chief whip was the final straw in a longer line of events that's led them to question the party's leadership. I think what has happened recently has been a kind of final moral um, and emotional trigger for people to say enough is enough. Any MPs who continue to support him are complicit in bringing the Conservative Party into disrepute. Whatever electoral appeal he did have, and, you know, we, we can't forget that he did deliver Brexit, um, you know, whatever your views on that are, but quite frankly, he's had his day. The feedback I get from residents, you know, it's very much, you know, we can't continue to support the Conservatives. So it's, 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 it's a really, you know, dark time for the party, but I'm hoping that if, if we do see a change, then that will at least give us some credibility back. These are a snapshot of views from the Tory southern heartlands, but Richard, county council leader and party member for more than 25 years, says he's heard similar from colleagues more widely. Yeah. The feel yeah. was that, that the, the lack of honesty was just eroding everyone's confidence um, and that, that that in itself, it was too corrosive. It, it, it wasn't some sort of Remainer plot. It was people saying, I'm sorry, character is just, just not there. What a different picture just two and a half years ago. Boris Johnson on the campaign trail here before he swept to election victory. Even now, some agree he does still have a public mandate. I like him. I know a lot of people don't, but I don't want him to go. I was, you know, for him, but um, at the moment I'm just not sure. I can't see anybody else that could look after the country like Boris has. But even in this Tory territory, there's wavering. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Wiltshire. Alex there with some voters uh, in parts of Wiltshire. Chris is back with me. Can we talk now about next steps? Mm. Because clearly you have this defiance in number 10, but you also have colleagues of Mr Johnson's who are equally adamant that he has to go. Mm. So how does this resolve itself? Let's look at the, the chain of events that could play out. So option one would be the Prime Minister sleeps on things tonight, wakes up tomorrow morning and concludes, you know what, the writing's on the wall, 
the podiums in the street and he offers his resignation. But what happens if he doesn't do that? Then you're going to start hearing again from Conservative MPs who will say, look, we have to find the mechanism to make this happen. Next week, we're going to see a new executive elected to what's known as the 1922 Committee of Backbench Conservative MPs. And the likelihood after that is you could then get a change in the rules that would allow another confidence vote to take place. The current rules say you can't have one if a Prime Minister has survived one for another year. So you could see that change in the rules, then you could see that vote, and assuming there were a majority of Conservative MPs who wanted Boris Johnson out, that would then lead to a situation where he'd lost that confidence vote and would be out. So there are the sequence of potential scenarios as to how this might play out uh, in the coming days. Everyone's guessing, that's the truth, and nobody tonight in Westminster is in sole charge of events. Uh, I know you're having a word with people as we go along, Chris, and uh, people messaging you, so we'll, we'll catch up again towards the end of the programme and get the latest intelligence there. Thanks very much, Chris Mason, there for us, our political editor. Now, Rishi Sunak's sudden resignation as Chancellor uh, and the letter he sent the Prime Minister revealed that he and Boris Johnson disagreed fundamentally on the management of the economy. The new Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, may be closer in ideology to the Prime Minister, saying that nothing is off the table in terms of tax and spending policy. But what is the challenge that uh, the economic situation is presenting? Here's our economics editor, Faisal Islam, with his analysis. Thanks to you, the new Chancellor Nadim Zahawi has a very difficult intro to deal with if he gets the chance. First up in the economy uh, is that it's slowing possibly to a halt and plausibly into a recession. As the OECD and others have forecast recently, the slowest of the major economies next year. The Chancellor acknowledged this challenge this morning, perhaps a hint of action, some sort of temporary stimulus. The problem is, of course, the rate of price rises. Inflation at a 40-year high, and not just heading higher uh, into double digits, but again, according to outside forecasts uh, and the Bank of England governor himself, fears that inflation here in the UK will remain more stubborn, staying higher for longer. Clearly, the principal driver behind this is energy prices. And we have been shown an energy industry calculation that bills under the energy price cap for an average household this winter will top £3,000 a year for all types. Direct debit, payments of the entire bill and prepayment meters, that would be the equivalent of a typical £50 top up lasting just four days. All this though is before the government's help of about £1,200 for the poorest families. This morning, there was a leap uh, in the point at which national insurance begins to be paid. Not now until £12,500 of earnings, certainly a significant effective tax cut on its own worth about £300. However, this comes just three months after a much bigger NI rise and a freezing of income tax thresholds that have seen millions of taxpayers pushed into pay paying higher tax rates. The mood music from the Chancellor this morning was that nothing was off the table and he would review major tax and spend decisions. Here are some of the op options from fast tracking, a uh, tax cut that's planned, an emergency VAT cut, cancelling some of the planned rise in business taxes and a further more direct cost of living support package over the next year. But would that mean more borrowing? Former Chancellor Rishi Sunak felt the PM should level with Britain about tough times and that extra government borrowing risked making inflation worse. The PM, if he survives, or even to survive, might be tempted to alter course on this. Hugh. Faisal, many thanks. Faisal Islam there, our economics uh, editor. Let's turn then to some of the day's other main news. One of the biggest war crimes investigations in modern times is underway in Ukraine. The International Criminal Court and national prosecutors are gathering evidence of Russian atrocities. Some of the worst took place in Bucha, which is a suburb uh, south of the capital, Kyiv. Uh, more than a thousand people are understood to have died during the month-long Russian occupation of towns in the region. And as our special correspondent Fergal Keane reports, there is psychological devastation for the families of the dead. A warning that there are some distressing details coming up. She's come to gather in what's left of the life of a lost son. <laughs> a man who loved laughter. <laughs> Denis Rodenko killed in a massacre. 
His mother, Katerina, has come to clear out Dennis's locker at the garage where he worked. <laughs> Dennis was 37, a father of two. He was shot dead by the Russians with seven other men on March 4th last at 144 Yablonska Street in Bucha. It began with ambushes. Ukrainian artillery stalled the Russian advance. The Russians encountered resistance here as they tried to break through to Kiev that they simply hadn't expected. So what they did was to launch a sweep right through the area, going house to house to find anyone they suspected of helping the Ukrainians. They arrested Denis Rudenko, seen here in the blue sweater, with eight other men. There was torture, then execution, beside the Russian base. His mother didn't see Dennis again until she saw his body in a mortuary a month later. Body number 316. It was Dennis. My husband. And I looked at it, but I didn't understand at first what the holes were. He was shot, and his thigh was shot through. And if I'm not mistaken, there were shots in his abdomen and his eye. There are still plenty traces of the Russians at 144 Yablonska, obscene graffiti on the walls. A soldier's military debit card we found in the rubbish. Old ration packs in what's now a crime scene. It was the place of the execution. All bodies were lying here in different positions. And the man leading Ukraine's investigation told us he's going after President Putin and his elite. That were the boot hit. It was definitely planned, planned in advance. It was instructed from the top. The suspects would be top of the top. So the guys who actually launched the war, let's say. Putin, his defense minister, all of Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a chain of people who, which decisions led to the invasion to Ukraine. Russia says the massacre was a fake, its standard response to even the most glaring truths. And the Kremlin isn't cowed by war crimes investigations. It'll be hard to get justice for Denis Rudenko while Vladimir Putin remains in power. Whatever will happen later, after the war ends, I don't care at all, honestly. I simply have no son. My dearest, my most beloved person. He cared for me so much. He was such an angel. Justice may or may not come, but the dead will stay dead. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Jablonska Street. Now, British Airways has announced it'll cut a further 10,300 short-haul flights from now to the end of October. The announcement comes amid growing travel chaos at some airports as the aviation industry struggles to cope with staff shortages. Let's join our travel correspondent, Katie Austin, with the latest details. Yes, this looks set to disrupt hundreds of thousands of passengers' plans. The affected flights are to or from Heathrow, Gatwick and London City airports in August, September and October. And they bring the total number of, fl of flights that British Airways has now cut from its April to October schedules to nearly 30,000. Now, many aviation businesses are struggling with staff shortages at the moment, just as demand for travel rebounds after COVID rules were eased. And we have seen 
disruption at airports and lots of airlines have already cancelled flights. This latest wave of advanced cancellations by British Airways comes after the UK government gave airlines a short window to hand back flight slots without the usual penalty and the point of that was to try and make schedules more reliable so that the flights that are running run less of a risk of last minute disruption or cancellation. So British Airways says it's consolidating some of its uh, quieter services to protect as many holiday flights as possible and it says it's contacting affected customers to offer them rebooking options or refunds. Katie, many thanks. Katie Austin there, our transport correspondent with the latest. Now, the heads of the British and American security services have made an unprecedented joint appearance uh, to warn of the national security and economic threat which they say is posed by China. The FBI director, Chris Ray and the MI5 head, Ken McCallum, outlined the dangers while addressing business leaders in London. Our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera, has more details. The two men whose job it is to keep the UK and US safe appearing in public together for the first time. Speaking inside MI5 headquarters to business and university leaders, they warned of what they said was an immense threat. The most game-changing challenge we face comes from the Chinese Communist Party. It's covertly applying pressure across the globe. This might feel abstract, but it's real and it's pressing. Amongst the worries is that naval exercises like these are China preparing for the possibility of invading Taiwan. The FBI director warned this path would lead to one of the most horrific business disruptions the world has ever seen. Even though Russia may have drawn most attention because of its invasion of Ukraine, today's joint appearance here at MI5 headquarters was a way of these two allies saying they believe that it's China that poses the biggest long-term threat to national and economic security. The Chinese government is set on stealing your technology. Whatever it is that makes your industry tick and using it to undercut your business and dominate your market. That includes by using cyber espionage but also more hands-on methods. We've even caught people out in the US heartland sneaking into fields to dig up proprietary genetically modified seeds which would have cost them nearly a decade and billions in research to develop themselves. China is likely to dismiss the warnings, but these two security chiefs believe the threat needs to be confronted. We both see persistent attempts to steal vital know-how from businesses and universities, and we see hidden interference campaigns attempting to manipulate the West. If we don't respond, this will have a dramatic impact on our nations. MI5 has more than doubled its work against China in the last three years and its director said it would be doubling again. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. Let's turn to some sports news. The women's Euros got underway with the hosts England beating Austria this evening before a crowd of 70,000 at Old Trafford. 16 teams will be aiming to be champions with the final taking place on July 31st. England are in Group A along with Northern Ireland, the only two home nations to qualify, as Natalie Perks tells us. The flags were out. The finishing touches were on and a summer of sport had finally arrived. A sellout Old Trafford was ready to welcome the moment where they hope women's footballers become household names and the game will change forever. It doesn't get any better as a women's football fan than this. It's, it, I get quite emotional. It just means the world. I just really want to be a footballer and watching these girls play is just really inspiring me. I am very excited as uh, women are finally getting the opportunity to like, show their footballing ability. The world is going to be watching England. The world is going to be watching women's football. Mead was again involved in a blistering attack. Record goal scorer Ellen White, though, couldn't have the final flourish. Plenty to ponder at half-time. The win wasn't in the bag yet. Austria, their first job is done. Smiles all round. Beyond words, um, yeah, what an amazing night. Great to start the tournament with a win and really happy to get a goal for my team. Well, let's go live to Old Trafford tonight. Our sports editor, Dan Rowan, is there. Dan, not just a, a big night for England, but a very big night for women's football. 
That's right, Hugh. Yes, a historic start to these Euros. That record crowd here at Old Trafford underlining the sense that this is the single biggest women's sports event to be held, perhaps in Europe, definitely here in England. England weren't at their best, in truth. They've been scoring at will in the build-up to this game. Not tonight. Austria frustrated them. They were resolute. Perhaps the pressure that comes with being among the favourites on home soil, the level of expectation slightly got to England. But in the end, they prevailed thanks to that first half goal by Beth Mead. You can't help feel, though, that Serena Wiegmann will sense that they have to improve if they are to go on and claim the first major tournament victory that they and the FA crave, of course, as they look to use this opportunity to build on the undoubted progress that women's football has made in this country in uh, recent years. Attention will now turn to debutants Northern Ireland, who get their campaign underway tomorrow against Norway in Southampton, but tonight belongs to the hosts, who get their tournament off to a winning start. Here. Look, this was another dramatic day. Dan, many thanks. Dan Rowan there, our sports editor at Old Trafford. Let's turn to the tennis. Rafael Nadal has kept alive his dream of a record 23rd Grand Slam after reaching the semi-finals of Wimbledon for the eighth time. The second seed beat the American Taylor Fritz in five sets. Our sports correspondent Joe Wilson was there. In the middle of centre court, the great man suddenly looked vulnerable. Rafael Nadal struggled with an abdominal problem that required medical attention, and he was required to go to a fifth set. Nadal's at the top of the screen, breaking Taylor Fritz's serve. Only for the American, seeded 11, to break back. Well, well, well. So to a fifth set tiebreak, a tennis penalty shootout. Nadal's won two Grand Slams this year. He's 36. This was the end of a 25-shot rally. There are any number of reasons to marvel at him. Nadal's still going. Remember, it was 14 years ago when he first won the title here. For me, uh, throwing back to 2008, uh, was difficult to imagine that in 2022 I will be here in Wimbledon playing, but uh, here I am and I'm happy for that. <laughs> the fact is, Rafael Nadal had four hours and 21 minutes on court. It's enough to make anyone want to sit down. And he's hoping he'll be fit for his semi-final. He knows who's waiting. This man, Nick Kyrgios, was largely in control of his quarter-final and of himself. He beat Christian Garin in straight sets. There may be many stories to come for Kyrgios, but next, it's his first Grand Slam singles semi-final. In the women's singles, former champion Simona Halep and Elena Rybakina, who's never been this far in a Grand Slam, reached the semi-finals. Into the final of the mixed doubles, it's Britain's Neil Skupski and his American partner Desiree Kravchuk. But we'll finish on court two and a close call out. Well, Hawkeye said in. Britain's Joe Salisbury and American Rajiv Ram reacted with their own, you cannot be serious. No way, man. Are you going to turn it off? Yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous. I'm, I'm not starting again until you turn it off. Yeah. Well, Hawkeye stayed on, the match did continue, and Salisbury finished it. And in terms of the semi finals, they're definitely in. Joe Wilson, BBC News, Wimbledon. Well, let's have more then. Uh on the main story tonight, which is the crisis surrounding Boris Johnson's uh, leadership and premiership. How are voters reacting to the events of the past 24 hours? The constituency of High Peak in Derbyshire went to the Conservatives from Labour at the last election. Dark correspondent Judith Moritz has been talking to some of the voters there. 200 miles from Westminster, Whaley Bridge feels far removed. But you don't have to look too far for ominous symbolism or for signs which could represent how locals are feeling. At the end of Johnson Street sits the builders' merchants, where they say they put a price on honesty. It'd be a lot cheaper than what we did yesterday, but I'll find yeah. out and I'll confirm the right, price okay. to you. And where views are changing. I felt sorry for him in a way, because he's had a lot of pressure, what with Covid, and then we're coming into the Ukraine war, which he's trying to sort that out. And then there's all the party gate, which I'm not sure about, but there's just too many lies coming out of his mouth. And after the two head ministers resigned yesterday, I thought, it is time now. If they haven't got confidence in Boris, then he does need to go. People here know how it feels when things are precarious. The PM visited them in 2019 when the town was evacuated because a nearby dam threatened to burst. 
there is plenty of support here for Conservative ideology. But the local MP only holds this seat by the slimmest of majorities, 590 votes. And so come a general election, what's going on at Westminster could make a real difference to this constituency. Issues like the cost of living are an obvious priority, but personality politics matter too, according to 18-year-old Gemma. So you're studying politics. What do you make of the, the professionals, of how, how the government are handling things? They're not being great role models, in all fairness. Like, we need someone there to be in charge and have that expertise and show us, guide us the way. They're meant to be the people with the knowledge who are meant to guide us, but they're just not. Oh, it matters to me a hell of a lot. Outside, I found Colin, whose loyalty is wavering. Did you vote Conservative? Are you a supporter I've of the I've been a Tories? Conservative all my life, since 1960-odd. And there's one thing I always believe in, and that is honesty. If you're not honest, the public will not have you. The town's no longer under threat from the Reservoir Dam, but whether the government has a bright future here is another matter. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Whaley Bridge. Some of the voters of uh, High Peak there and uh, political editor Chris Mason joining me once again for a, a final roundup at the end of this rather turbulent day. Um, Chris, any developments since we last spoke and where do you think this is heading tomorrow? Developments in just the last couple of minutes, Hugh. Another cabinet resignation. This time it is Simon Hart, the Secretary of State for Wales. It's worth just reading a couple of lines from his resignation letter tonight. I had desperately hoped, he said, that I could avoid writing this letter, but alas, there seems no other option left to me than to resign from my role as Secretary of State for Wales. He concludes, I've never been a massive fan of ministerial resignations as the best means of forcing change, but colleagues have done their utmost in public and in private to help you turn the ship around. But it is with sadness that I feel we have passed the point where this is possible. Today has been a day, Hugh, defined by the movement of power. It's been moving away from Boris Johnson. You could feel it in the House of Commons earlier, the demeanour, the facial expressions. You could sense that the time would soon be up for Boris Johnson. I had a text exchange with a cabinet minister, as a cabinet minister still serving tonight, and I said to him this afternoon, does it not feel like curtains? And the reply from this cabinet minister was, yes, I'm sad to say, I think it does. It's going to happen within hours or days. And I think we can say tonight that yes, Boris Johnson's resignation as Prime Minister is imminent, but that word imminent in politics can be rather elastic. It might mean tomorrow, it might be a few days away. He may try and cling on via other mechanisms that we can't yet anticipate, because such is the character, very distinctive character of our current Prime Minister. But as a result of what has happened today, we can conclude he will be resigning soon. Let's see what tomorrow brings, Chris. Thanks very much again. Chris Mason there, our political editor, with uh, some last thoughts at the end of uh, this BBC News at 10. Um, let's join Louise at this point and just get a catch up on the weather. Hi, Louise. Hi there, Hugh. Well, the weather has been quite quiet today, but quite grey generally. It's warm out there, but there has been a lot of low grey cloud, and that's been the story so far this week. That story is set to change, however, over the next few days. But let's just take a look at how much cloud we've seen today. You can see how extensive it was. Quite breezy and cool with some outbreaks of rain, and it's still quite drizzly at the moment along the far north and west facing coasts of Scotland. But as we go through the next few days, high pressure will start to dominate. We'll see certainly more sunshine, and as a result, more heat. In fact, it might get a little bit too hot for some of you as we move into next week. So there's the high pressure slowly starting to build in from the Atlantic. The jet stream is way to the north and if you've been watching the weather forecast by now you'll know that if we're on the southern flank of that jet stream we're always in the warmer air. So it will start off relatively mild, sunny first thing in the morning across eastern Scotland and any early morning low grey cloud will quickly melt away. There's going to be a lot of sunshine around tomorrow generally. The exception the far north and west here it will stay cooler and the temperatures around mid-teens. But with that sunshine, well, it's strong at this time of year and the temperatures really starting to climb up. 25 degrees is 77 Fahrenheit. As we go into Friday, even more sunshine is expected for many. Once again, the far west, northwest generally, we'll see a little more cloud and maybe the odd spot or two of drizzle at times. Here, those temperatures are a little suppressed, but they are going to continue to climb up to highs of 28 Celsius, 82 Fahrenheit by Friday and as we head towards the weekend and into next week we're going to see those temperatures into the 30s. It's going to be hot by day and by night that might get a little bit too hot for some. Hugh. 
Indeed, Louise, thanks very much, Louise uh, Leo there. That's it uh, from Downing Street for tonight. News night already underway on BBC Two. And here on BBC One, it's time to join all of our colleagues uh, in the nations and regions uh, for the news where you are. But from the 10 o'clock news team, good night. <laughs>